Thanks so much for joining us. We're going to talk all about the Glass House, which is in New Canaan, Connecticut. My guests are Greg Sages, the executive director, and Hillary Lewis, chief curator of the Glass House. Before yeah. we start talking about it, I want to show folks what the Glass House is. We have two pictures. Great. So Beautiful. this is Glass House, which indeed it is glass on 49 acres, correct? That's yes. Correct. Okay. And then this is a closer shot of the Glass House. How did this come to be, Greg? Well, the Glass House is a site of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. It was originally Philip Johnson's homestead. Famous architect. Famous architect. Mid-century modern. Uh, New Canaan is an enclave of mid-century modern architecture. Philip Johnson was one of Harvard Five architects who settled there and uh, did a number of projects. Ours is the only one that's currently open to the public, though. There were more than 100 at one point, and there's probably just under 100 remaining. Of glass houses? Of mid-century moderns, mid many of which modern. have Not all completely glass, glass such as, as ours, but they certainly are modern and innovative, primarily from the 1950s, 1960s. But the fact that we have truly the glass house, that we actually have the guts to use that in a definite <laughs> article, the, that we are the glass, the glass house, house, because when Johnson designed it, it was designed really as, yeah. a, as a concept. Um, Johnson was not only an architect, he also was a curator. He'd been working at the Museum of Modern Art and had just done a show in 1947 with Mies van der Rohe, the very famous German architect, one of the great figures of the Bauhaus, and showed a design that Mies had designed for a similar type of structure, what later became known as the Farnsworth House, which is also part of the National Trust. Um, and so Johnson took that idea, transformed it somewhat, and made it even more about being a perfect rectangular work of glass. With no interior walls. No interior, no interior wall, walls. There is, of course, a, a series of, of cabinets that act essentially as a wall that allows for a little bit of a barrier between the bedroom and the rest of the space. I think for most of us, when we walk into a space like that, you say, well, this feels a little bit like a loft in New York. It's not so unusual. But in 1949, people weren't living in lofts in New York. No. So this was a, a very innovative idea of having that free plan. But as Johnson said, it really was a 1920s concept because Mies van der Rohe had designed things of this type in the early days of modernism, but not a full house of glass such as this. So this was something quite special that Johnson did, and again, Mies did something similar mm -hmm. outside of Chicago, which is now called the Farnsworth House. Quite secluded. In 1949, yes. they lived there? They lived they, there. Yes. In an entire glass house. Yes, and I think for most people, they think, oh my gosh, you know, your neighbors are looking right in, you know, how could this be? But in truth, as, as you know, we now have nearly 50 acres, just under 49 acres. But when Johnson first purchased the property, it was only five acres, but it was still down a slope. You couldn't see into the house from the road. So he always had enough seclusion that he wasn't uh, exhibiting himself, shall we say, to the rest of the world. Not that I think he cared if he was exhibiting Probably himself. Probably not. No. no. Not he was, at all. He had neat as a pin with fabulous uh, furniture and, and artwork that uh, certainly always looked fabulous from, uh, from whenever it was being photographed. So it was, always, it was always ready for the camera. But we should also point out, Greg, that of course the glass house is paired with something called the brick house. Maybe I should let you speak about this, but you know, there's a there's complete exposure paired with complete enclosure, and that's a big preservation project for us right now. They're really right. two wings of a single house. Yeah, I mean, maybe 100 feet apart across a, a grass quad. Um, the, the brick house is actually where the utilities reside. The glass house couldn't exist without the brick house, but it was a single composition completed in 1949. You mentioned earlier about 49 acres. I should say they are 49 curated acres because that was another aspect of Johnston's skills. He was a landscape architect who did a number of commissions around the country. Um, and there are actually 14 structures. It isn't just the glass house brick house. There are 14 structures on the property today, 49 uh, curated acres, and then a collection of contemporary art and sculpture, which most people when they come to visit us are not even aware of. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of people aren't aware of it because I, no, I, have, I will admit I have never been to the Glass House, right. which I will now have to come. We can't wait to have you there. So there, there are artifacts. There, there's artwork. There's all kinds of stuff. So when, when the person, when a, when a person comes to visit the Glass House, yes. what are they going to see as they drive up? Well, there's a, um, 
We're, we're a non-conforming use in a residential community, so there's a special operating permit that governs how we operate. And that means that all of our visitors come to a downtown visitor center and then are brought, brought by our vehicle oh, to okay. the site. So we kind of control the access to the site and what people see. Our tours are very structured and uh, they range from uh, a visit of just the glass house itself to more extensive tours that cover five of the buildings. And we can customize anything, you know, that a visitor would like to see. From May to November. From, from May, May to November. Exactly. Yeah. And, but almost all of our visitors uh, of, of get an opportunity to see not only the glass house itself, but also usually an overview of our art collections. We have both a painting gallery, a sculpture gallery. I should note that Philip Johnson wasn't just an architect. Originally, he was both a collector and a curator. His first job was as the initial curator of architecture at the Museum of Modern Art, which was a brand new institution in 1930 when he graduated from Harvard College. And so he was part of the art world as much as being part of the architecture world. And so we still have just really just a small bit of his collection, which is still quite impressive, um, overwhelmingly 20th century American art, but masterworks by Frank Stella, Andy Warhol, Robert Rauschenberg, uh, Jasper Johns. What a time. It, it's quite something. <laughs> so so it's, it's not just a, a few artifacts. It's, it is quite a, a beautiful collection that one gets to see within buildings that are designed specifically to be uh, exhibiting both art um, a painting and sculpture um, by Philip Johnson. Let's go back to the close-up, if we can, of the glass house. Just sure. to take um, a close-up look. So, yes. what revolves around this from May to November? There are all kinds of things going on inside this house. Well, what's actually is going on is outside the house, Anne. I would argue because it's an integration of uh, landscape and architecture brought together. Johnson used to joke when uh, uh, clients would say to him, Mr. Johnson, could you design me a glass house? He'd say, ah, but do you have the land? Do you have the property that warrants having a glass house? The sure. whole point of this, as he would say, would be to kind of, uh, to be in what he said, it was a permanent camping trip, a point of origin, an opportunity to be in the landscape in the most urbane and elegant and conceptual way. And yet he was a great lover of nature, of the Connecticut countryside. He spent as much time at the glass house as he could, even though he maintained a home in New York as well. But it's really about that landscape, about seeing the landscape from the interior and it changes with time. If it's a blustery day, if it's a sunny day, if it's snowing, you have a completely different experience. How big is it? What's the square footage of the house? Uh, Just about 1,800 square feet. Oh, okay. And the glass, I'm thinking, must be very thick. It's actually not that it's thick. It's not. It's not that thick. It was glass that was available at that time to be um, as wide a span as possible. Technology has changed. Today you could have larger plates of glass. Um, so that uh, it, it kind of determines the architectural design of the frame, the steel frame of the house. But when you're inside, you very much feel as though you're, you're outside. You're outside. In fact, <laughs> exactly. the famous line of Frank Lloyd Wright was, you know, Philip, am I inside or am I out? Do I take my hat off or do I leave it on? Oh, that's because it was you, this experience of being outdoors. As executive director, what types of events do you have there throughout so the year? We have a number of different types of events. We have uh, speaking engagements by preeminent pre architects, uh, artists. Taking place inside or outside? They can take place depending upon the size of the expected gotcha. audience okay. in the glass house or in another building on our property or else in uh, we do joint ventures with uh, uh, local library or the New Canaan uh, Historical Society yeah. and in fact we've done a couple down in Manhattan and would look to do more of those things. Uh, we also have uh, performance artists that appear on the property, so ranging from music to uh, dance, uh, all kinds of things. Justice Johnson lived on the property and he made it a place of experimentation, both in terms of um, uh, materials and techniques for architecture, but also cultural. Absolutely. It was an ongoing salon, Anne, in terms of art, architecture, culture, I love that music. term, salon, because it's everything. It's yeah. It really it's was. Everything. Every walk of life. Yes. I should mention, uh, in case you were wondering, Hillary knows Philip Johnson fairly well. <laughs> yeah, I've written I, several books with him. I did, and I also had the opportunity to work with him for Why over a decade. Why do you find him so fascinating? He represented the entirety of the history of the 20th century, because he was born in 1906. 
died in 2005, and he worked from 1930 until his death uh, and was part of pretty much every movement of architecture as well as being one of the great collectors of, of contemporary art. He was one of the largest donors to the Museum of Modern Art mm -hmm. and also was considered by many, quote unquote, to be the dean of American architecture. So there was quite a lot there. I'm, I'm an architectural historian by training, so it was an extraordinarily how interesting you, time for me to spend time with How did you get into that field? Oh, goodness. I <laughs> fell in love with buildings. Fell in love with looking as a, at As a little kid? As a, someone as a little kid. You know, walking around New York and looking at beautiful buildings. Um, and as a, uh, a student in, at, at university, I uh, started paying more attention to those types of courses and then went on to graduate study in architectural history and urban planning and while I was doing that graduate work is when I met Philip Johnson and we started working on a book together which led to all my connections with the glass house and working with Craig so you have people worldwide coming here <coughs> is there one country outside of the US more particular that wants to see this glass house is it England is it Germany uh, I would say Germany recently we've had a lot of visitation from Japan yes I think the uh, year for which we have the most recent statistics compiled we had visitors from 48 other countries and 48 of the 50 states. It's truly an iconic pilgrimage. And what the do they house. marvel at the most when they look at this dwelling? Simplicity? Well, I think it's the simplicity, but also, as in many things, is something that uh, was so well known. If you studied art history or you studied architectural history, you probably saw pictures of this building. But seeing it in person was something that was limited only to those who were friends with Philip Johnson until the National Trust, through our operation, opened the site to the public in 2007. Were he and Frank Lloyd Wright good friends? I they can, were I friendly. Can... They were a very different generation. Frank sure. Lloyd Wright was born in 1867 and Philip Johnson in 1906, so they had a little bit of a spread of age. Um, but uh, they um, did know each other. Philip Johnson did an important show with Frank Lloyd Wright in 1949 at the Museum of Modern Art, exactly when Frank Lloyd Wright was working on a, an important project in New Canaan and as Philip Johnson would say where else was he gonna come to get a cocktail so <laughs> he spent some time at the glass house. Did, did he entertain quite a lot in this glass house? He did he mm -hmm. did. I mean, some events are more uh, renowned than others, and especially in, in 1967, there was an important event known as a country happening, uh, where Merce Cunningham uh, performed to the music of John Cage. Both men were present. Uh, the Velvet Underground kind of was the after-party uh, band. So if you had an invitation to this uh, house in the honored. country, you'd yeah. go. You. <laughs> I'd have now, a good time. There weren't guest quarters, I wouldn't think, no. in 1,800 s square feet. Well, there's the, there are the two buildings in the sense that there's the brick house and the glass okay. house. The brick house contains a guest room, um, a spare bedroom. Uh, and Johnson used to joke, well, the problem with having a guest house is that you get guests. So, as he would say that, of course, as he got much older. But, yes, there were some people who were lucky enough to be invited to stay overnight. As executive director, when you walk the grounds and when you go into the glass house, what, what do you marvel? at the most? Well, I don't come from a background of either art or architecture, so it was a completely new experience to me. I think I marvel most at the dedication of the team that, that is involved with the Glass House. They're not there for money. They're there for, you know, love of the institution, love of uh, his architecture, and, uh, but the grounds are incredibly peaceful. So we've assembled 49 acres, and the adjacent properties are literally hundreds of other acres that will never be developed. Wow. So there's tremendous wildlife on the site. Yes. There's solitude, there's quiet, there's just beautiful, you know, landscaping. As executive director, have you ever sat in the house alone when nobody was around and just took that all in? Yeah, actually, just a couple of years ago, for the first time, I came up there in the winter when we were closed and went inside and just sat there, and it's like being in a snow globe. But as uh, Hillary said, That's it's clear. like every season there's something different to experience. A rainstorm would be fantastic, just uh, sitting inside that house. And you, have you ever been in there alone? I have, in fact, it's an interesting story. And the first time I came to see the glass house, and Philip Johnson was still alive at that time, this is before the National Trust had taken the property over, even though Johnson had given the property to the trust in 1986. Uh, he, he had the property until he passed in 2005. And I was working with him on a book, but I had not yet been to the property. And we were discussing the house, and he looked at me like I was a bit of an idiot when I admitted that I didn't know the property from having visited. And he said, well, goodness, you better do some research and come back to me next week. So of course I got to visit it on a day that he and his companion, David Whitney, were not 
in residence. They often spent time in New York. So when I arrived, there wasn't a soul there. And it was... You were giddy, right? I was giddy, but also <laughs> was terrified because I thought, oh my goodness, perhaps I'm trespassing, I'm doing something wrong. And there was, at that time, a different phone that was uh, sitting in the, in, in the house, and I called it and reached the office in New York, and magically, a groundskeeper arrived and squared me about. But it was a, quite an extraordinary experience. I will say, for most of our visitors, they don't have such a different experience. We don't have large tours. Most people are on a tour of approximately a dozen folks. Oh, that's And so terrific. it's quite intimate. Uh, you <coughs> do not have crowds around you. It's only once a year that we have a, a, a wonderful uh, festivity, our, our summer party, when you'll have hundreds of people on the site. But other than that, it's, it's quite an intimate experience, which is very much how Philip Johnson and his companion David Whitney utilize the site. What do you want people to know about the Glass House? Because I think a lot of people don't know about it. Well, that it's, uh, there was a rumor at one point that it was sold out. And in the first couple of years, uh, the tickets did sell out in a three-day period. That is not the case anymore. You know, the backlog of people who wanted to attend has you know, worked its way through the system. We've expanded our capacity, and so tickets are available. I think that... But uh, don't lollygag around. Don't lollygag know. around, particularly <laughs> if it's a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. The uh, weekends yeah. are more densely packed. Uh, we're open Monday and Thursday as well, and uh, it's, it's a fantastic site. The, the ratings of our visitors indicate that they have a wonderful experience and uh, you know they recommend it to their friends. What do you want them to know about the house? Well I think also that it, uh, it we, it's not just for regular tours we also do special events uh, as Greg mentioned we sometimes are, have the opportunity to present whether it be music or um, performance art. We also do lectures. Uh, we have a number of those going on each season. So it's an opportunity for people to be with us after hours. Uh, we also offer some tours that are self-guided and therefore you have an opportunity to be on the property without being shepherded by one of our certainly very capable educators, but for some people, especially architects who have studied the property and want to experience it in a certain way, and also folks who care about landscape. One thing also I would like to add though is that the landscape is so special because not only is it it's beautiful, of course, 18th century, uh, uh, former 18th century farmland uh, that Johnson converted to his purposes, but in a way Johnson was taking the idea of late 18th, early 19th century European gardens and converting that to his purposes and marrying that to modern architecture. This is quite unusual. And so it's quite special when you visit our property and get this, it's a very luxurious thing to have that type of curated landscape as Greg described it. Um, and this is something that Johnson was passionate about. Uh, and I don't think that everyone who's even studied him understands that so clearly, but they'll feel it as soon as they come to the property. I've got to read your books. I and, really, I really do. And the uh, events that Hillary just mentioned, some of them are in the evening. That's a unique opportunity. We don't do tours in the evening, yes. but these events allow you to see the property. The landscape lighting that uh, Johnson put in is Wow, very special as well. And then the house it's, must be all lit up. It yeah. is all lit up. You know, Johnson realized, and I imagine you know, anyone with a house in the, in the country would understand this, that if you don't light your landscape at night when you look through glass, it's just black. So he worked with one of the great lighting designers of mid-century with whom he had done many projects. For example, Lincoln Center in New York. Uh, he worked with uh, Richard Kelly, Dick Kelly, uh, a very famed figure. And that's who did the lighting on our property. So it's done in a very intentional and artistic way, as Johnson did Pretty much everything in his life. I can't wait to see it. And anybody who wants to see it, the glasshouse.org. That's right. It's actually, yeah, the glasshouse.org. And it's, there's history, it, there's all kinds of stuff on there. There's all kinds of videos of things that have occurred on the property and uh, upcoming events, all kinds of information there. What's sure. the splashiest thing you're going to have this year? Well, it's, well we, our, our party, which is coming up, is absolutely fabulous, and as it is every year. Anything that we want to yeah, talk about a little uh, about that? Coincidentally, it's the 70th anniversary of completion of um, True. Uh, the structures in 1949. 1949. Right. And it's also the um, 100th anniversary of the Bauhaus and 50th anniversary of Stonewall Riots, which is a symbol of uh, the gay struggle. And so we're going to do programming around those three uh, particular uh, Sounds subjects. like this is the year to go. This is the year to go, and I think it's something that actually it's very important to raise that and for many people, they, they don't know that much about Philip Johnson's personal life, that he had a relationship from 1960 till the time that both he and his companion David passed away in 2005, so nearly 45 years together. So it, the property is really not just about Philip Johnson, but it's also about Philip Johnson and his life with David Whitney, who was an important figure in the arts as well. And the show that we're putting together right now actually addresses that. So there's always something 
something to see architecturally. There's always something to see artistically when you come to our site. And for those who just love landscape, we certainly have acres and acres of that. And we do change out exhibitions, so for those who have already been there, there's good reason to come back and see it. We do preservation projects, so we've replaced the roof on our painting gallery, which stores a priceless collection of artwork. And most recently, we did a complete restoration of the sculpture gallery. And uh, we're about to embark on a restoration of the brick house, which unfortunately has been closed for a number of years while we fundraise to uh, try and get the money to do all the So you're in the, the capital work. campaign phase of that? We yeah. are. Yeah. We are. So we, we want to get that open so that people who come to visit us have the full experience of seeing all of the architecture that we have. I think one of the great surprises, Anne, also, is that the architecture is so different. People kind of expect that the glass house is a glass box sitting on a flat shelf of land. Uh, in truth, it is surrounded by rolling hills. Uh, there's changes of grade. It's quite dramatic, um, as well as there's different phases of architecture. Johnson lived a long time. He practiced for about 70 years. So he had a, an opportunity to build in almost every style. And this really was his uh, tab um, kind of uh, uh, landscape to, to experiment with and to try many different ideas. And this is what we have on the property. So we have quite a collection of buildings. We have quite a collection of furniture. I should also note that the furniture is extraordinary. Johnson was not a poor man. And in 1930, at 24 years old, his first job at Museum of Modern Art, he had a rented apartment in New York, and he hired Mies van der Rohe to design his apartment. Of course he did. Of course he did. <laughs> and so the wonderful, we talked about the 100th anniversary of the Bauhaus, our furniture is essentially uh, that of the Bauhaus master. Long before people could buy such things from Knoll, um, uh, these came from Germany and were designed by Mies van der Rohe. And so this is the furniture Johnson used for the longest time. I remember right. asking him, I said, my goodness, this was quite extravagant. He said, well, I got a lot of use out of it. <laughs> over the decades. Yes. Well, it sounds fascinating. I can't wait to see it. Good. And again, it's theglasshouse.org. Greg and Hillary, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Spend all night kissing and a bump is right here, then who else is missing? Got a little sidetrack to find my solution and find the keys to the door, but it's also a metaphor. Things keep dying in the grocery store of my mind. Just the same time, skip right ahead to the last ride.